So, uh, preachers, we uh, know that this has been a busy season for you, and we are so grateful uh, that you have uh, stayed with us and that you have been faithful in the communities where you have a sphere of influence. And we just want to thank you for the work that you do. We really think that good preaching changes lives. In some cases, it saves lives. And so we're grateful uh, that you're making the extra effort uh, during this season to, to preach well, to preach faithfully, uh, and to preach honestly. And now that you go into Holy Week, know that you are held with the love that Jesus talks about on that last night of his life, of love one another as I have loved you, that God holds you in that love, Jesus holds you in that love. And we are so grateful that you preach that love uh, to the people who need to hear it. So thank you for your thank you for your preaching and know that you are held this week as you anticipate the resurrection in love. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. We are looking at the text for the resurrection of our Lord, Easter Sunday on April 17th, 2022. Happy Easter, friends. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. And we'll talk more about that. Our friend Rolf is still taking some time away, but the three of us have got it under control. We are going to look at Acts 10, 34 through 43. Some churches might read Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. We're going to stick with Acts. We can only do so much. Psalm 118, verses 1 through 2 and 14 through 24. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 26. And because we love the gospel so much, we're going to do two gospel texts. Luke 24, 1 through 12. And the alternate is John 20, 1 through 18. Depending upon which lectionary you subscribe to, or whether you do or do not do an Easter vigil. Obviously, there are plenty of preaching and worship opportunities. And our preachers, we know, are probably a little tired. You've gotten through Holy Week, or at least as you're writing this sermon, you are somewhere probably in Holy Week. And so I think we should say at the outset, we are uh, grateful for your work, the extra work that happens this time of year, and pray that it is a renewing time for you uh, as well in your vocation. Hardworking preachers, uh, but some fantastic texts this week, right? Should we begin with the Luke 24, the Lucan uh, resurrection discovery? No appearance of Jesus in this text, but the uh, the discovery and Luke's particular spin on it with, uh, with confusion giving way to recognition or remembrance, but also, of course, the, um, I think skeptical is too, too mild of a word to describe the response to the women when they come. Uh, what do we make of that? This is a kind of a, it's not a mean Easter text, but it's, it's one that, that, uh, that exposes some interesting rifts or gaps between those who can bear witness uh, and those who uh, either refuse to or have not yet um, opened themselves up to the, the resurrection story. Yeah, I think the one thing that you said early on, Matt, uh, is an important observation that this is not a resurrection appearance yet. I, this is not. This is this is a discovery, and uh, and paying attention then to the dynamics of the text with that in mind, I think uh, brings up a number of different. Uh, feelings about this text. One of the things that I've been uh, working on lately with my sabbatical project is, is thinking about uh, the resurrection stories as trauma narratives and uh, the way in which trauma theory can inform our, uh, our experience of these passages. And, and here, especially where you have, you know, there, you have this uh, response of, of perplexed, <laughs> right, is the translation, but terrified, uh, and the, and, and the need to be reminded and to remember. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the the quote unquote idle tale did not believe them. And then Peter is uh, and Peter goes home amazed. And so when you pay attention to the verbs here, uh, I, that's what I, I kind of want the preacher to create in some kind of way is is. What would it be like to be at the tomb? And uh, and this is the discovery. There is no resurrection yet. 
and and the kinds of responses that you have in a moment where the body is gone right that the, there is no body and and the way in which that functions as a kind of double trauma you have the trauma of the resurrection or of the crucifixion that reality and now the body's gone and uh so before we even get to you know resurrection and peeps and trumpets and jelly beans and all of that, uh, that this was the experience. And, and uh, in that, in that in between place, that middle place. Uh, and I, that's what I feel like um, needs might need to be preached this year. I really appreciate um, uh, this uh, focusing on the reality of what this, this particular scene captures. Um, I uh, was thinking of uh, how much I appreciate a good sunrise service. And um, whatever you do with the Easter service uh, on, um, uh, in the, um, uh, during your, your regular morning uh, worship, um, the opportunity to just have that surprise and discovery of this particular scene, I think is a great opportunity right here. Um, when the sun rises, uh, just as the service peaks, um, we, uh, for me, I just love it um, when it's not too cold. Uh, <laughs> but um, those, the, the particular familiarity of this scene and of this, of this text uh, and of this particular service, people show up for Easter service. Um, and it's the one story that they've heard over and over again. And so uh, I think it's important for us to take that turn. Uh, this is about discovery. Um, so how do we ask the questions? How do we lean into the scene a little differently? Um, and I'm, I was really appreciative of, of Lucy Hogan's um, commentary, um, particularly to think back, not just to what Jesus says, but to all the things that God has done. Uh, how do you pull every promise, every uh, thing that has happened, and then go to this place at the end of a weekend that was traumatic, as you said, Caroline, uh, and then the very thing that you came to do, you can't do because the body's not there. And then you go back and you try to explain what just happened. And in your, um, in your confusion, uh, in your um, um, confusion is probably the best word. You're not making sense because what you're trying to convey doesn't make sense. Um, how, how do you communicate with that kind of, uh, of, of rehearsal that has the, I don't know what I'm saying, but I need you to take it in and I need you to feel it and experience it and then I need you to respond, but not, I'm gonna tell you how to respond. Not, this is the response you have to have. How do, how do, how do we pause to frame a, a sermon that is so filled with the moment that people lean in and uh, respond in a way that isn't scripted? And I think that's how we recover just the awe of that moment. And it should be awesome enough for folks to say, it can't be, it just can't be. And then we're on to something because that's the beginning of a story that will be told over and over again, I don't know, for 2000 years. I like the idea of beginning with it can't be. I mean, that's a nice rhetorical move too for a sermon. Some preachers might be bothering or borrowing that one this week. It's I think I say this a lot when I talk about Luke's resurrection stories, but belief is not the natural response for anybody. And sometimes that's because they're shielded from the belief. In the case of the apostles, it might be just because they, they, they think the women are hysterical or something. I mean, there's, there's something there beyond just belief is hard. There's a, there's a rift in the community that we need to attend to. I would also cheat a little bit. This is going to shock our listeners and both of you. I would maybe jump to Acts for a, a point of, of kind of anchoring this. And I jump to the, the Pentecost sermon on Acts 2, where Peter has the line, it was impossible for death to hold him in its power. 
that's that's part of the Pentecost sermon, and, and I would link that up to where the uh, these two angelic figures say, "Why do you look for the living among the dead?" Mm -hmm. and set up the tomb as a kind of site of conflict between God and death, and that could be done in really overly dramatic or melodramatic ways that probably would not be helpful on Easter Sunday. But to talk about what's going on here, this isn't just Jesus slipping away; that some kind of a cosmic confrontation has taken place here that like most conflict conf <laughs> confrontations in scripture utterly is beyond our ability to comprehend as human beings and what they see what they experience what they're told is only probably a small part of a much bigger reality that's taking place mm -hmm. so so much we could say i also don't want to i don't want to leave john on the table as they say <laughs> Because here you actually have an appearance, but you also have confusion. You also have questions about belief, disbelief, and what's going on, but really in, a, in John's own idiom. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Joy. Oh, no, no, I was good. Yeah, you, could, you can go ahead, because there's your trauma. You know. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's what I was just about to say, uh, that you, you, know, you, you read this text and you, um, I, I particularly go to, you know, the the 11 to 18 section of the of the story and the um and that four times it's mentioned that she's weeping and uh that she that and it also that mary is alone at the at the tomb which is unlike the other gospels i uh, and she was also at the foot of the cross she's also named as one at the foot of the cross and now she's alone at the at the tomb and uh, you know, weeping outside the tomb and that, that, uh, again, that confusion, right. Of uh, not knowing who he is. And, and I, I think, uh, I think uh, homiletically, I would go somewhere with this along the lines of, of what, what, what do you need? And this is kind of, this is a, a talk about cheating, Matt, this is kind of, uh, going forward into the Thomas narrative for next week, but, uh, the the appearance to Thomas, but there's a a pattern in the fourth gospel of Jesus meeting these these disciples where they are, where they're at, or what they need, meeting their needs to be called from really their own death to life. Uh, and for all intents and purposes, this is a discipleship narrative. And so, I guess my my homiletical move here would be what for to invite people to imagine what what is it they that they need uh to make that uh to have their own sort of resurrection moment uh is it their name being called is it is it uh being able to touch jesus wounds or what do we need from jesus this year uh for us to move and i'm thinking i'm, I'm thinking widely too of the pandemic to move from the this two-year experience of many many deaths which both literal and figurative, which is how a trauma is defined as, as either a literal or figurative death. Uh, and what is it, what does it begin thinking about what it is that we're gonna need to move from death to new life? So that's kind of where I landed with John this year. I love that. And uh, the, uh, the, the other idea that I think that it's the same that uh, we, we find uh, in the Luke text is, I'm just gonna repeat myself, not to define what is needed, but to present what is needed. So not to say, you know, you need to believe or not to say um, this is done for you, but to do it, to rhetorically, you know, provide options. Um, um, when, when I'm preaching, I like to repeat myself over and over again. So, you know, I'll say something is awesome. Something is incredible. Something is um, beyond belief. Um, but you can do that not by the one word, but you can do that by describing something that is uh, incredible. Uh, and that incredible might be a ma March Madness score or, or loss. Uh, it, it, it could be uh, a decision um, that is made by a family member in relationship to caring for someone who is sick. Um, it could be a circumstance that has led to war in our society. And in those three um, lines, I 
talk, talked about personal, I talked about uh, the, our cultural, and I talked about global. I don't know what you need. I don't know what your listeners need. Someone might be watching the news and the war in Ukraine is what's capturing their attention. Someone else might be caring for a sick parent or, or and, and that might be where they need. So what I'm trying to say is find rhetorical ways to, to bring in everybody and not simply say, um, calling your name is the way that, that Jesus is going to meet you. And, and you describe that, Caroline, by pushing us to the rest of the story that we do know. Um, and, and so how do, we, how do we tap into that familiarity? That, that's, that's what I would say about this. Yeah, you both cover that so well. And, and Joy, too, you wrote on this um, on, on the website and it's still my favorite part of the story <laughs> and he does call Mary by her name. Absolutely. And, but you, correct. And that's, there's an intimacy here that's and an, an individuality in terms of one having their own encounter. That's crucial. Uh, but I also want to talk about, because I don't know if I've ever really thought about this as much as I did this time around uh, the other two disciples and, uh, and entering into the tomb. There's this, there's so many odd details about who's faster and, one goes into the tomb and looks, and the one goes actually in. It's, and with John, I'm always, I'm always enticed by the symbolism. And sometimes I think I want there to be more symbolism than there is. But is there something about going into the tomb? Are we supposed to see something in that? Mm. And and with most symbols, of course, it's well. If you see something, then then go for it and run with it. But. I do wonder if there's, and not that one's better or worse, but there's something about looking in, but then there's something about uh, Peter going in, and then that makes the other disciple, or no, it doesn't make him, but after that, the, the beloved disciple goes in. Is there something about interiority or opening oneself up to a mystery or going into a place of death and decay to discover? I mean, I don't, Caroline, you've, you've, you've thought about John a little bit and read a couple of things about John in your life, um, or Joy as well. Are there, has anybody done stuff with that? Well, I, um, yeah, that's really, it's really interesting when you think about the, the way in which uh, some of the Im imagery about um, closed spaces works, right? So uh, we'll get that, of course, in the Thomas narrative or the, the place where they are is locked, but then also the garden where uh, it, it, Jesus arrests the disciples. Jesus and the disciples go into the garden, a fold like John 10. So it's this enclosed space of intimacy and and relationship. And then and then Jesus, knowing all that's going to happen, comes out, you know, the, the sheep go in and out and find pasture. I uh, in John 10. So there's a lot of inside outside and Judas uh, when he betrays Jesus by leaving the room, he goes out <laughs> and it was night. Uh, so there might be something there. I think maybe the other thing too is what they see because you have uh, you have the repetition of seeing the 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 wrappings line there and that's the same word as the the cloth that bound Lazarus and so Lazarus comes out still bound uh, and but Jesus the 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 bindings are are left behind and so it's I, I think there's a lot of invitation there to, uh, you know, that it, it, Jesus says to, uh, you know, about Lazarus, unbind him and let him go. And Jesus has already been unbound and is out. And so, uh, and so then how you, how you, what do you think of that? And what kinds of promises then are going to unfold? I think it actually maybe might also lead to what Jesus asks Mary to to announce, he doesn't ask her to announce that he's been raised. Uh, he, because he's already done that. I mean, <laughs> that's already happened. Uh, but he announces that he, I am ascending. So that unbinding and letting go means not just that he's raised, but now he continues the work that he has been sent to do, and that is to uh, ascend and prepare this abiding place for his disciples. So uh, I think it has something to do with that. That's my thought. Good question. I'm, 
And that's a great question. And if you carry that kind of symbolism, um, and I'm, I'm just going to stay here this week. What does it mean for us to do something that will cause someone else to follow us in this faith? You know, so, you know, the, the beloved disciple doesn't run in first, but then follows. Um, but he is faster. He wants that to be known. Yes, he does want uh, that to be known. Well, it's also a narrative technique on the part of John that that he will he will describe important events in real time so to put you there so that's true for the foot washing uh it's true for be jesus being anointed how do you bring and so we are i mean we're meant to you know we're meant to be one running along <laughs> uh and and what is it that we want to see and what will we see and what and and that's to go back to going into the tomb and then seeing the wrappings lying there then what goes through your head if those those death binds are are left behind um and so it's a lot of uh, wonderful um in, invitation i think to uh, to uh to your own confession of i have seen the lord or what or what you like said. that we're we're running alongside yep i still yes. think john wants to be sure that i know i will never outrun the beloved disciple <laughs> well, and i also know oh, that yeah. to be quite true <laughs> I would be yeah. last. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, but, but, and then to, just to consider who that character is. I mean, that the beloved disciple was introduced, you all know this, but the beloved disciple was introduced in 1323, which is not included in the lectionary. So you really have to be intentional about, about going back and saying, uh, it, that's when he was first introduced, reclining on the, on the, you know, the breast of Jesus at the supper. But then he's also at the foot of the cross. And now here, and I, uh, and of course he's never named. And so you all, all y'all know my shtick, which is uh, I believe the beloved disciple is meant to be us. It's our, uh, it's the reader or the listener of the gospel is the one whom Jesus loves, and that's where we're supposed to be. And so here we are, on the last night of Jesus' life, uh, at his death, and now at his resurrection. So I think that's kind of, that's where we're supposed to be. Yeah. Does anybody want to talk about Acts? I bet well, I know who does. <laughs> Go for it then. Oh, I'm sure you two do. I, you know, people know I spend a lot of time in Acts. And this is this text is is the Easter text every single year. Right. If I remember correctly. So yes, I've probably is. podcasted on this text 11 times or something like that. But and it's obviously dislocated from context, which is fine. It's a, it's an example of what gospel preaching might look like and and example of what one might say on, on Easter Sunday, but mm -hmm. I'll just point out one quick thing is all of the God language. Mm -hmm. All the time God is uh, either the subject of a verb or uh, the object of a preposition, just the, we can go through and kind of underline mm -hmm. uh, where, where God is mentioned, which is, is common in different parts of Acts, especially around extraordinary events and discovering the implications of the gospel. So we see that in Acts chapter 11, when they talk about the inclusion of Gentiles, you'll see that in chapter 15, when they talk about, again, inclusion of Gentiles, that, that the, the line is often, this is what God has done in our midst. And you see that in Luke's gospel, for example, um, um, in some ways about God, uh, uh, the way Luke talks about self, uh, re repentance, excuse me. That that's a, it's a it's a, a divine action that takes place. So it raises questions for me about or how a preacher might talk about how do you detect God? How do you name God's agency? That's perhaps easy to do on Easter Sunday. At least everybody knows the script, right? He's risen. He's risen indeed. But you know that's that's the weight of two thousand years of of the church's confession. That's that's a harder thing to say. In the moment of discovery that god did this right that's the benefit of hindsight the theolo the theological advantage of hindsight so mm -hmm. i just kind of i wonder that that some in some congregations thinking a bit about how can you tell when god has done something mm -hmm. and how is amazement part of that how are displays of power part of that who gets to name those things 
and in what kinds of contexts. Because of course, as soon as somebody says, God is telling me, or God did this, there's going to be conflict because God um, appears not to speak to large groups in the way that God might have once done in the pages of scripture. Yeah, I, I that that's great. I, I, it, that's one of the things that that uh, that drew me in this time around too was just the repetition of God. God did this. God's agency in all of this is just so uh, so present. I think the other thing too, and and by this tying it back to really both of the gospels is the emphasis on witness and testifying and testimony. Uh, that and it, that the resurrection, the the story of the resurrection is meant to be testified to and 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 how might a sermon maybe explore that uh it, it, it invite that invite that testimony to say that the resurrection was never meant meant to be uh as you were alluding to you know doctrinized and codified and and uh and you know denominationalized and and as you know, something that we have our you know that that makes our our what we do legitimate or something like that. It's meant to be testified to, in terms of what does it mean, and 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 give give witness to that. So maybe a, a sermon invites that for uh, that the, the the resurrection is not a one time event. It's it's uh, it keeps going. It's uh, it, the the dailiness and the life givingness of it is ongoing um, because of our testimony. And uh, I, the line that sticks out for me in, is uh, that, that God shows no partiality. And going back to what we already talked about in, in each of the gospel uh, texts is all those that are included, uh, the women, the disciples, uh, and also the difference that they needed to experience God's um, non-partiality, you know, that, that, you know, the calling of the name moving forward to what Thomas needed. Um, and, and so bearing witness to what God is doing, not what I have believed, but bearing witness to what God is doing over and over again so that I recognize, oh, wow, this is incredible. This must be something the Lord is doing. Excellent. We need to skip lightly over the psalm, not because we don't like it, but because it's Easter Sunday and we're it's anticipating. What, anybody want to say anything about the psalm? I'm just going to use the opening that Paul makes in the commentary. Um, sometimes a single refrain uh, is enough to help. And in, in many ways, that's what this psalm is. It's, it's a familiar um, single refrain. Um, whether it's giving thanks to the Lord or recognizing that God is good, or more importantly, that one in, in the end of verse two, uh, his steadfast love endures forever. The whole of that, that psalm is what God has been, is doing, and our, to use the language we just talked about, our bearing witness to it so that folks recognize it again, a single refrain. And that refrain on this Sunday could be, he is risen, he is risen indeed. Excellent. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, there's uh, a, a rather important passage as well. So I'll just start off by saying, you know, I, I talked about the cosmic conflict that might be implied in Luke when it's don't look for the living among the dead, that the tomb is that kind of a place. Uh, Paul might want to go along with that as well with this idea of what still is yet to come is this battle, this, this victory over powers, cosmic powers, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death, that, the, that Easter is not the last act in this drama, but is the beginning of the final battle, so to speak, if you want to, to use those kinds of terms for it. Yeah, and then I, I think, you know, with this passage, it uh, it's just so clear uh, the promise uh, that we hold on to that that uh, that hope in Christ <laughs> is so clearly stated here by Paul that the res the resurrection of the dead has also come through one human being and that's Jesus and and maybe given um, 
given this Easter after two years of a pandemic and as of now coming out of that and the kinds the kind of death that has surrounded us maybe a resurrection uh, Easter sermon simply says that that, that is our promise as well um, and for all of our all of our loved ones that um, that that is that's what we that's what we confess today.